Gina Grad is uh, sitting in traffic, off-ramp closed, blah, 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 but we'll bring her in in a couple of seconds. Good news, Bald Brian is here. Yeah, thunderstorming outside. I like it. What, uh, Brian, fresh off his trip from Maine. Yeah, buddy. Uh, the thunder and lightning will come into play in a moment. But, yeah, the trip to Maine was for uh, mother-in-law's 70th birthday. Mm-hmm. And I don't know. I don't know. I know you had a um, – you tell the story of um, – one of your last interactions with your mother-in-law where she wouldn't come out of the house, and that was a bit of a... Cops had to show up. bit of a moment. Mm-hmm. I, I, have, I don't have the same relationship with my mother-in-law. It's a very, very loving. I, it's, it's often like you described, like uh, uh, when you say... You talk about how to do jokes and how to uh, be humorous about things in your life. Like, ask me about my mother-in-law, and it's like she's a wonderful woman. Well, that's the boring version, right. the, you know, the, uh, the funny version. Is oh, that old, you know, bag of bones, blah blah blah. But battle axe yeah. works, but nice. <laughs> she's yeah. a lovely lady. She turned seventy, and she wanted to bring the whole family, Christy, her brother, the spouses, and the grandkids, to Maine for a week for her seventieth birthday. Now, does she also have the house on the island? That is actually technically, well, it's the grandparents. Yes, this is the same mother-in-law, ah. but that was uh, the dad's parents. Mm-hmm. They bought the house in 79 for mm-hmm. $200,000. Right, you know, that's now 4.7. So uh, uh, yeah, smart with the money. Right. All right. So you go to Maine. So go to, they, they, the, the, the plan was, well, will all the kids and the grandkids please come to Maine for a week? And I'm like, I can't, mm-hmm. I can't go for a week. I mean, I, I, I would love to go uh, based on the show schedule. I can, I can pull off like four days. Mm-hmm. So we left Thursday night after this show on a red eye. First of all, no direct flights to Maine. Yeah, I was going to say. No, and, 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 no airline offers a direct flight from LAX to Portland, Maine. I had to mm-hmm. fly. My choices were connect somewhere mm-hmm. or fly direct to Boston, which we did, and make the drive up. So we did the red eye Thursday night to Maine. Uh, Tessa slept across our laps. I slept zero minutes. Mm. Zero. I don't sleep while on planes. Man. And here I am, zero minutes uh, of sleep landing in Boston at 5.55 a.m. You know, I feel your pain. Brutal. Um, going to Nashville, doing the same thing next week. But at least you can fly direct. Yeah. Couple at least. things. Yeah. So first things first, you owe it to everyone in your immediate family to live in a place with a direct flight. <laughs> <laughs> or expect, yeah, that or, would be the ideal. Or bring, or, the, or bring them out into yes, Mohammed. Exactly. Or expect right. that the things will not always work out quite so smoothly. Yes. Live, you, God bless you. You should live in Atlanta or Denver. You should live in a hub. Well put. If yeah, you live in a live in, hub. Live in Midway. <laughs> live in a hub. If you live in a hub, there's right. unlimited flights in and yeah. unlimited flights out. But uh, all right, so you have to do that. The second thing is, is you know, everyone has this thing where you go, "Here's what I wish for. I wish this for my children." Uh, I wish Gina Grad is joining us. You didn't miss anything, Gina. Sorry, thank you. Um, the I wish for my children that they could sleep on an airplane. Oh my that, god! That'd be what, the greatest what a life. Be the greatest gift because I'm with you. You fly out on a red eye. Everyone has this fantasy of oh, like okay. well, five and a half good hours. Yeah, good luck. you'll sleep five yeah. hours on the plane, then you'll wake up refreshed oh, when they hand you a hot towel. Just fucking <laughs> and brutal. The reality is, is it's 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 plagued at best. Like you know, if I can, I'll, I'll never enter REM. But if I can lay there motionless for 18 minutes at a time before being jostled by somebody, no. uh, then I can cobble together uh, 67 minutes of right. sleep. And then you wake up wherever or you land wherever you land sure. and you're a goddamn wreck. I'm a good husband. I gave Christy the uh, window seat so she was able to, you know, mm. put the head up there and nod off. Tessa, of course, draped across our laps. But, you know, five-year-olds, they twitch. You know, they move. They got the legs. Like, they're squirmy. Yes. Yeah. And so she's asleep for four hours or whatever it is, Tessa is. But she's kicking me and I'm just kind of taking it because I'm a good dad and zero hours of sleep. Right. So you wake up and... People don't really real. I think they think they do. You're disoriented when you do not sleep. <laughs> it is sad how much we need sleep. And you're emotional. You're angry, and yeah. you're also sad. Your wires are frayed. <laughs> Irritated, <laughs> yes. agitated. You're walking through the airport. What's what the fucking Cinnabon? <laughs> yes. This, what, what is how this? dare they make donuts at <laughs> five in the morning? Bullshit. Yeah. So you're you're already agitated. 
And uh, then you make the how many hour drive? Uh, well, we decided to break it up because we had all day. Couldn't check into the whatever it was, VRB or Airbnb. I didn't book it at till 4 p.m. And that's all mm-hmm. the way north of uh, Booth Bay Harbor, mm-hmm. the north of Portland. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we had the three and a half hour Three hour, three and a half hour drive. Thank you. But that's okay because we're going to make a day out of it, right? We're going to have a day driving in New England. Uh, by the way, have you guys ever actually physically driven in downtown Boston? I've mm-hmm. never been to Boston. It's fu- it, the Answer worst. Answer the fucking question. <laughs> <laughs> the no. worst traffic I've ever experienced in a major downtown. LA wow. has worst traffic on the freeways right. and on the West LA and you know, all the Hollywood right. and whatever. Worst traffic. Has anyone here ever driven downtown? Yeah, it's we have. Crazy. I have. But yeah. the people are super polite, right? One the accent's way, cool. Oh, they're all really sweet. Well, One they had way, the cobblestone streets. Yes, <laughs> and they had the big dig going on yes. over there for an extended period of time. So not only was it bad, but it was worse because they were doing this big dig, which I think lasted for 15 years or something like that. But anyway. So we get uh, breakfast. The first thing we do, we're all hungry. We're all you know emotional. <laughs> we get breakfast. It was lovely. Meet up with the uh, in-laws who had ch- flown into Boston the night before. Mm-hmm. Met them at their hotel and made the trip up north. Stopped in Kennebunkport. Oh, mm. fancy. Yeah, I know. It was mm-hmm. awesome. I've never, never been, obviously. It was lovely. It's a little seaside town where the bushes have their mm-hmm. right. compound. Did every town shit. try to out-charm each other? It was It was, It was. was a lot of Hallmark movie charm, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Is it the, big, the, the big city girl who goes, yeah. to the, goes to town with her Starbucks cup and her, her Blackberry. And the leaves are changing. That was the that was one of the main reasons. Oh, uh, Christy's dad's a very good photographer. I wanted to get, you know, leaf, mm-hmm. leaf peeping. I see all the leaves. Mm-hmm. Kind of bunk part was sweet. It's where I had my first lobster. Mm. Ever? No, no, no. The trip. <laughs> oh, okay. I mean, we're talking Come like on. five five lobsters in like four Jesus. days. Nice. Lobsters, check, your, check your iodine level. Lobster, I should. Lobsters out there are tacos out here. That mm. is working man blue yes. collar food. I swear mm-hmm. to Christ, every every restaurant or shack we went to, and we went to more than one like lobster stand, mm-hmm. was like as though you were going to a food truck out here and getting like street tacos. Right. Like it, it we were, they were there with truckers and just blue collar dudes and guys on their lunch break and city workers and it devouring lobster. Wow. Yeah. Here it's the it's local fair. Pretty much just surf and turf at the high end. Yeah. State yeah. It's market joints. price. Mm-hmm. Lobster to us is, you know, fancy night right. out, out there. Mm-hmm. It's fucking, you know, what's for lunch? Wow. The tip. Fried lobster. It's basically really? popcorn shrimp. They chop up the lobster uh-huh. fresh and they deep fry it. Oh, keto was the was, was long gone for these four <laughs> days. I went to two breweries, multiple fried lobsters, uh, apple cider donuts. The best. Mm. That's a Kansas thing. Yes. Did you have uh, lobster rolls? Yes. Oh, those oh, yeah. with well, a I big. Ha- I had bites. Oh, I big tasted. soft bread, and it's all mixed with mayonnaise and lemon, and oh. essentially lobster salad yeah. inside of a roll. The best. You know, it strikes me that lobsters had a pretty good run. Mm. You know, they've probably been around since the prehistoric days. Yeah, oh, the yeah. crustaceous and days. People looked at them as like ocean cockroaches, yeah. and so we went after. After the tuna and the swordfish mm-hmm. and everything, but at some point, and maybe there's something to that slave food thing, if you guys have ever heard that. But no, no, what is slave food? Well, you can look it up now. Um, I know the slave for paid insult. Well, I, we're not paid. You know what I mean? Like I they know. Were, they were I, the, guys I, the the, the, the tale. The, the tale is is they fed the slaves lobster because it wasn't considered. Oh, it, was right. a, it was a body feeder. For, and, yeah, right. For I th- I thought the that gentry. was what they fed prisoners too in Australia because they were oh, everywhere. Well, that makes sense. Yeah. but they had a pretty good run of. Ugh, I'm yeah. not going to eat that cockroach. Uh, they come to. Uh, we're going to wait in line to eat you. Yeah, yeah. seriously. Lobsters. Yeah were considered the, quote, poor man's chicken <laughs> and primarily used for fertilizer or fed to prisoners and slaves. There you go. There you You're go. Right. Throw up some pictures if you got them, Kaylin, from my Instagram. So we did stuff for the kids. So Tessa's five, her cousin's two. We went to oh. the botanical gardens where they have these fucking giant oh. gnomes made out of wood. Like, they're brand new. They're like two mm. months old. They're made by this Danish artist. And you can just see them. They're, they're, they're 20 feet tall, 25 did, feet tall. Did Tessa scream Earth Giants from Frozen? Uh, no, she didn't get that far, but she did. Like, we had to find. We had to walk fucking eleven thousand steps wow. to find all of them. Uh, that was cool. We went to uh, apple picking. We mm. picked fresh uh, Maine apples. Oh yeah, Tess at the town guard. Yeah, come first, on, Chris, that's a picture that comes with a frame. That's ridiculous. Tess is being lifted up and picking the apple. Uh, is a fresh apple any better eh. than uh, the ones you get at the Gelson's? Eh. 
Not really. Yeah. It's just because you're eating it outside yeah, and the air's the a little crisper. The, but no, okay, I've been apple little, picking a million maybe, times. Maybe a little, like maybe 10% more. Possibly. But these are Macintosh apples. I like the honey crisp. Yeah. You know, they're good. Don't get me wrong. These are very good. Um, and these are the whole thing. What do I got next? Oh, and did a, did a boat tour at Goose I'm Bay sorry. Harbor. Does Christy not know what a hoodie is? <laughs> did she have to go in her Sunday best to all of these things? <laughs> she's wearing the uh, garbage bag. No, no, she's not. So we're taking a uh, boat trip around Booth Bay Harbor where we stayed, mm-hmm. and, and they gave us a, um, a lobster catching demo for all the kids. Like they mm-hmm. pulled up one of the you know one of the uh, traps, right, with lobster inside. Yeah, it's true. We catch lobsters like we catch roaches, as I was thinking about uh. it. You know, we don't go spear spearing <laughs> roaches. We just set the trap, and snare them, let them show up. So. Uh. <laughs> Sorry, continue. No, is there any more any more good pictures I forgot about? Lobster, lobster, lobster feet. Like this is the, we're in a pit. At least two of the four days I was there, we had meals on picnic benches. Like mm. that. That's just how it is out there. Maine's a very sort of bohemian, blue collary kind of place, but also mm-hmm. very quaint and mm-hmm. seaside. It's got a you know, it's not bougie like Balboa Island, but right. it's not you know uh, down at the dumps like a lot of places. It's right, right. It's got a very working class vibe to it. And it's about three and a half drive from Boston. Depending on where you go. Portland's probably a little closer, two and a half. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, when the only other time I only time I've been in Maine, it was all about the lighthouses. I was so many light. transfixed. You could do a lighthouse tour. Gorgeous, gorgeous. Did you get any? It uh, was Tessa into the lighthouses. Uh, not as much, okay. but I mean, there was a lot for her to you know do do and yeah. see or stimulus stimulation overload. Right. Finally, uh, here we are outside of another another lobster shack. We're just uh, you know this is post meal. We're all lobster high. Right. Uh, so the tr- so the flight home. So here. Long story. I'll make this as brief That's as possible. That's what I've been waiting for. Brief as possible. Misery. Brief as possible. Uh, I was going to, uh, Chris and I arranged for me to zoom into the shows the last couple of days. And at the last minute, he's like, don't worry about it. We're good. Just, we'll see you on Tuesday. I had a flight booked at 8 a.m. out of Boston. Mm, Do the math on that. Now we're had, talking. I would have had to wake up at 3, Three. 3.30 in yeah. the morning and make the almost mm-hmm. pitch black trip mm-hmm. from fucking Booth Bay Harbor in Maine to Boston. Chris texted me the night before, the afternoon before, at least on the East Coast. It was like, yeah, no, don't worry about zooming in. We'll see you. And that freed me up to take a nighttime flight because I wouldn't have been able to do this show yesterday and then make it to, no, no late flights from Maine to LA. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I get on Southwest. I book with points right away. The last flight that leaves Maine last night from Portland through Midway to LAX, mm. Midway, you know, Chicago. Mm. This mm-hmm. Midway. Mm. Uh, and uh, of course, I'm watching football on the TV. It's great. Um, and uh, Lightning Storm delays the uh, Monday night game. A mm-hmm. lot of lightning here. And I'm like, how long is this going to go for? Yeah, there's mm-hmm. a roof on that stadium. I don't. Yeah. Not sure where the lightning's getting in. I was there the day before, but the, te- the, the explanation I heard was that it's more of a tent or a tarp. The, of course, it's, I'm sure it's more rigid than that, but it's it's not it's not an official dome and part of the stadium. <clears throat> so if it goes in, I'm holding my hands, you know, a foot apart. Halfway through is underneath. Halfway up is above ground. Mm-hmm. So apparently that so was so funny. Some kind this of keeps danger. coming up. <laughs> Yeah, it's exactly. a it's, it's a dome. As a matter of fact, I think they light it up and they put uh, they put advertisements and stuff on the roof. But it's translucent. You can see. Yeah, it's translucent. Uh, but um, anyway, doesn't they have doesn't ways, seem like so. there's much lightning danger in that place because there's a solid translucent roof on it. But maybe it can come in sideways. Well, maybe, Who knows? maybe yeah, not that place, but maybe in the air because we're flying from Chicago to L.A. <laughs> also, a lot of the NFL guys are sporting chains <laughs> these oh, days. Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. That is Gold, a magnet, magnet, conductor of, magnet for uh, lightning. Uh, electricity. So you're flying in. For, uh, yeah, connect, I made my connection flying now from Midway to LAX, and it's taking a lot longer than I thought because you have the flight tracker on the on the Southwest right. app. It shows you know two hours left, and I keep saying two hours left, two hours left. I'm like, oh, it must be stuck. so. You're in the air. Then it says two hours, fifteen minutes left. I'm in the air, and I'm like, what the fuck? So I look at the map. We are circling Albuquerque, like we're going <laughs> around and around and over Albuquerque. I'm like, that's very strange. I wonder if the map's screwed up. Map's not screwed up. So I'm supposed to land at 11:30 at night. Uh, what ended up happening? is because of, I guess because of the lightning, they were not letting us land. Mm-hmm. And because we were not letting being allowed to land, we ran out of fuel oh and we God. had to land in Ontario. 
Uh, really? Into Ontario? Ontario is a very small town. Ontario, oh. California. Yeah. It's not a very small town. But what Ontario I say Mills is, Outlet. It's a very yeah. small airport for people outside the area. Weird that you couldn't make it that last 45 miles or yeah. something to LAX. Now, SoFi's in the flight path mm -hmm. of LAX. So if there's SoFi's being lightning delayed, then everything at LAX is lightning delayed because right. it's a stone's throw away and you go right over the top of it. So we land at Ontario, which again, like Adam says, 40 miles away. It's very close. It's strange that they made us land there. It must have been critically low on fuel because when we landed, the pilot goes, all right, folks, uh, we're going to re refuel here and uh, wait wait for word on what we're going to do, whether we're going to get you home or whether we're going to stay here. <sighs> Ontario Airport is closed. We are the only human being. I mean, I'm sure there's maintenance guys cleaning up, but you know what I'm saying? There's no travelers <laughs> right. mm -hmm. in this goddamn airport. It, it's, it's 1230 at night. It's closed. Uh, and so we land, and this is the announcement you never want to hear. If you want to take your bags and get off the plane, you're more than welcome to. Yeah. We'll let you know when you can get back on. Because if it was quick refuel and quick up, they'd be like, stay in your seat seats. on. We'll be out in 45 minutes. Yeah. And they're like, oh, well, hey, now, you want to get I mean, out and use the restroom? Go I'm, ahead. I'm thinking about the Uber from Ontario to I your house. I looked up. Wait, wasn't this where Keanu Reeves organized that group, remember, when they had to land in Ontario? Mm -hmm. And there's that video of one of the, the people on his plane. And Keanu's like, okay, if we all get a shuttle, we can all get a shuttle together. Oh, this is what like happens in Ontario, on yes, mm -hmm. to get That's, back to L.A. As soon as I landed, I, got, I was on. I was able to get to the you know the, the wireless, or, or the, the LTE, and I looked up and it was, uh, it would have been like 80 two dollars to get from ontario uh, to to uh, lax which is where my car was parked but i was like all right well this is an option i asked the uh, flight attendant i'm like hey man he passed by like on his way back i'm like hey man realistically no bullshit <laughs> i said that how long how how long do you think this is going to take he's like seriously i'm like yeah just give me an honest answer he goes could be an hour and a half, and I'm like, uh, ah, that point. You got you got to split the sevens. I know that. I know at that point, I'm like, and Ugh. you got to call Chrissy and ask for permission. Right. And maybe two dollars. Right. I mean, exactly. there's, there's a lot of money to spend, and there's a lot of paperwork. <laughs> That's right. And you, you got <laughs> to get, an get the okay. Well, no, or, the, the debate was, you know, stay on the plane right. for the ninety minutes. Yeah, the, uh, the ninety minute is the over under. Exactly. One, if it had been two, plus two hours, hours Uber yep, driving home. One hour, yep, no problemo. But that is the over on so? and, and pleasantly, for the, for the first time, my expectations were exceeded because we probably hit the air in 55, 65 mm. minutes. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? It was, it was, everyone get back. Because one of the announcements was there's only two fuel trucks at this airport. Small airport. There's only two fuel trucks. So we need to wait for them to finish fueling up the other airplane so they can get over here. Mm -hmm. so, uh, this all sounds very rickety. The flight like from Ontario to LAX has to be. 19 Dude, minutes that was or surreal. Something. It was 20 minutes. We never, I swear to you, we never got more than between five or 10,000 feet off the air. We just cruised <laughs> at like landing altitude. You know that mm -hmm. landing yeah. altitude you cruise? We just cruised at that altitude for, for 20 minutes. Where the ground isn't that weird focal point that you can't quite yeah. figure out. Like, I mean, we kind of tell what city we're over. Right. Like, oh, yeah, that's but you, you're, you're oddly close and you're oddly far away. It was bizarre. What time did you land at LAX? Uh, what the oh, fuck? Um, Only one? Two, two, I got Keanu's it. story was Bakersfield, uh, so says Chris. I wonder if there was a flight out of Bakersfield. Anyway. I got into bed at 2.40 p.m., so wow. let's reverse mm -hmm. engineer that. I think a I got- A.M., right? A.M., yes, of right. course, A.M. And I think I landed about 1.30, but then I got to catch the shuttle. It's fucking raining at this point. <laughs> I got to catch the fucking parking spot yeah. shuttle. Yeah, my, my thing with the 70th birthday party <laughs> is live in a hub mm -hmm. or- Meet at a neutral site. Mm -hmm. You know, let's go to Orlando. Right. Okay. Let's go talking. see Disney World. Sure. Like, find a <laughs> neutral site, like you the Super Bowl. Right. You don't. You don't fly in and then drive three and a half hours. Yeah, it's tough. The irony with your crystal brain is that they take an annual vacation to Orlando every year because they have like best friends out there. And this is yeah. the time they, they, go, to the Bay Hill, yeah. they go to the Bay Hill golf tournaments. <laughs> um, all right, so uh, a uh, an odyssey, but Seriously. but a great experience. It, I'm glad I'll, I'll never fly from Ontario <laughs> to LA again, let alone at eight thousand feet. Uh, so I had uh, country superstar oh, John Rich in sorry, here. Buddy, sorry, sorry. Of course, no trip would be fun, would be complete without gifts. No. Mm. Oh, oh, you brought gifts. I know. La. I know you're all <laughs> committed to the keto lifestyle as I am, but if you guys should have a cheat day. 
I got you all authentic oh, Maine syrup. Thank, thank you. you. Wow. wow. Produced no, locally. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I got some for everyone here. So Wait, enjoy. these are these are for the flight, right? <laughs> that's right. These are your little, travelers? A little nip on the flight. If yours thank is a little you. lower, that's why. Uh, thank you. Yes, of course. Enjoy. All right. So uh, country superstar John Rich was in this uh, studio a little bit ago. And I uh, was interviewing him for Take a Knee. I, I did his show at the uh, other shop. It's Fox show. But something, he said a couple things that I thought were interesting. And then he, he reminded me of something that's interesting. So... He grew up in Amarillo, Texas, on the Panhandle, and his dad was a preacher. Mm. All right. And uh, but it wasn't a big mega church preacher. He was old school preacher. Had a lot of different jobs, but preach. But he said he want he was so committed to bringing it to the people, like that kind of preacher, that he went to New Orleans for Mardi Gras thirty two years in a row. And set up his soapbox right in the French Quarter. Oh, boy. And his acoustic guitar. And he preached 32 consecutive Mardi Gras. Probably did a little horn. Uh, yeah. yeah. But he didn't play that closer sure. to the right. vest. Sure. But he went there and he said drunken people just spat at him. The, yeah, I was going to say, any time. converts in three decades? Well, he said something that was interesting yeah, to, some people the other way. <laughs> to John, because John was talking about, you know, you write a hundred songs, you get one hit yeah. out of it. And I said, yeah, you pitch a hundred TV shows, you get one on the air. People have to understand mm -hmm. that's right. the process. And his dad would say, I'd talk to a hundred people, but one of them, one of them would, you know, a hundred people would walk past him right. and spit at him. And then one would stop and talk to him. And he said it was worth it Amazing. for that. 32 years. I disagree. Uh, the other... It's a massive waste of time. I, do, I agree. I didn't <laughs> want to say anything to the man. The uh, other thing, the the thought experiment that I... Uh, re I reminded me of this thing I said in, a, in the car on the way to SoFi, which is um, think about... So think about the people you know who are effective people we talk about people, we go, oh, that guy's honest, or that guy's hardworking, or that person's lazy, or that person's late, or mm -hmm. whatever it is. But I, I just came up with this sort of yardstick, which is take everyone you know, family members, friends, coworkers, and stuff, and think who, if you had, you invested all your savings mm -hmm. into one food truck, who would you want running that food truck? Mm. Okay. And when you say it that way, there's people immediately pop to mind where you go, I want that guy sure. running my food truck. Yep. And then there are people where you burst out laughing. Yes. Right? <laughs> yes. Sure. It, sure. If you're one of the people, and you, we're all included in this possibility, mm -hmm. if someone bursts out laughing when they bring up your name, mm. that's a bad sign Indeed, for you. Yeah. Yeah. It's a look in the mirror. It's time. a tell. Yes. Yeah, like, so the, the thought experiment is... If this thing was posed to family, your family, husband, wife, whatever, mm -hmm. or your immediate community, would anyone pick you? <laughs> or how much laughter would there be <laughs> if your name came up? Interesting. Interesting. Because it's, and by the way, there's no confusion. You drop a couple of names. You can bust up yeah. everyone in the SUV. <laughs> oh, Christy and I are a package deal. Right. <laughs> so, well, mean, that changes the yeah, game. That changes everything completely. Completely. But I mean, I thought food truck because it involves every aspect yeah. of sort of you have to be early. Yeah. You have to go. You have to. You have to pre-plan. Mm -hmm. You got to get your stuff the night before. It's a great example because you have to be creative with the menu and you, you know Marketing. make it look good. And marketing. You also have to be very practical. There's about like health codes, yeah, yeah, and yeah. someone's going to put a temp thing in the mayonnaise at some point. <laughs> Want to know if it's warmer yeah, than it should be? Right. Like there's, it's all under one tent. Yeah. This sort of right brain, left yes. brain. It's all there. Who would that person be, it's, and would it be you? It's so funny because I would always say unequivocally, not me. But after planning this GD wedding, mm. I could do it. I just don't want to do it. Yeah, you can't nominate yourself, Gina. God <laughs> Dawson, no self-nominating. Nope. <laughs> now, Dawson, I I would have you pretty low on most people's list, Good. but not but not for. I don't no. Not Actually, sure. I wouldn't put Dawson. No, alone. it's it's just the morning call. Yeah, it's oh, just, yeah. It's the early call. The that, till might not always add up. No, 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 no. He's there for fourth meal. He does the night shift. Oh, that's a good point. Oh, when, yeah. when the bars are closing. Yeah, I just 
I, I just thought... How am I going to do that drunk? That's a good question. <laughs> yeah, I, there's a lot of different ways to kind of measure or whatever, but I just thought the food truck, that's good. That'll, Put- that'll cover all of it. You also have to have... There's going to be three or four people underneath that person, mm-hmm. and they can't call them Dick Wad every right. ten seconds or something, <laughs> or they're going to walk. You know, they have to sort of deal with them yeah. and motivate them. New plan: Gary runs the food truck. Chris cooks. Dawson in the sandwich board out front. Yes. All right. He's the barker. Yeah. He's the barker. All right. Let me tell you guys about the uh, X chair. Yeah. From the uh, first moment I sat in my X chair, I thought, oh. Where have you been all my life? This is a real office chair. This is what an office chair is supposed to feel like. I got an X chair years ago, and now I got the new X chair as well. Uh, You never look forward to sitting down so much than uh, when you hit that X chair. Can your current chair give you a massage or heat Mm -hmm. or cool you down? X chair can with LMX massage and temperature regulation exclusively designed for X chair. Plus, Customized support of X chairs, patented dynamic variable lumbar, or a DVL as they call it. Try X chair for yourself, risk free for 30 days. Once you realize just how much better your chair could be in that X chair, you'll never go back. It's X chair, right, Dawson? Go to xchairadam.com now. That's letter X chair, A D A M dot com, or call 1 844 4 X chair for $100 off your order. X chair has a 30 day guarantee of complete comfort, and you can finance your purchase for as little as $30 a month. Xchairadam.com. All right. Oh, we're getting X chairs for the studio, by Ooh, the way. So we just, got them, we just got them delivered today. Oh, hell yeah. Well, we got Lamar Odom and we got Mike Zappi Zappelin, who uh, put together a very interesting documentary called Lamar Odom Reborn. And um, you can find out all the information at LamarOdomReborn.com. And it's a very interesting tale. I watched it last night. So congratulations on that. Thank you. Did you you enjoy it? Yeah, I did. I enjoyed it quite a bit. I I found it. I mean, I love documentaries because, you know, there's a version. You get a snapshot version of people that you just see quickly on TMZ. And then you see a doc on them and you get to know them as human beings. Um, So how did the doc come about? Uh, Well, you know, this is Zappy. Um, Feel feel free to call me. I was going to say, feel free to call me Zappy. There's too many mics out there. But uh yeah, Lamar, I got it. I, I basically was showing one of my my first film, The Reality of Truth, and somebody came up to me after it and they said, hey, it was about two years ago. And they said, hey, I'm friends with Lamar and I just saw your movie and I think he needs some plant medicine. Would you be willing to talk to him and, you know, maybe hopefully even give him some plant medicine? And uh, I met Lamar and we hit it off and he at some point trusted me enough to come do some psychedelics with me and at the same time was brave enough to be somebody who would let me film that. I mean, I wouldn't even let me film that, but Lamar is a brave guy. Well, Lamar, you had your bouts with addiction and everyone knows about the story of you being at the love ranch and basically flatlining and everything. And, and you, even after that episode, you still dabbled in, in drugs, correct? Uh, yeah, a little bit. Yeah. You're right. You can hear me? <laughs> yeah, we can hear you now. Yeah. And <clears throat> is and so and and also a lot of lot of trauma coming up. I know your mom died at a young age. I know your yeah. your dad was uh, a, addicted as well. Um yeah. How do you look at yourself now? Do you do you look at yourself as recovering? How would you how would you title yourself now? Um, well, I, shit, you did the amount of drugs that I've done. I, I'm, I'm always going to be in recovery. Um, well, I mean, I'm in a, hel- a healthy mental space. I'm happy. Uh, I would say I'm thriving at this point in my life. I'm 41 years old. I feel like I can get, I can get better. And, uh, that's what the ketamine is, is, is trying to just keep me at my best all the time. So describe what the ketamine does, Zappy, if you would. Uh, Yeah. So this is a real medical breakthrough. I mean, I think this is going to save Western culture before we go off this cliff. It looks like we're going off because this is a powerful 
uh, psychedelic, but it's a dissociative. So it's what it's doing is it's basically dissociating your left and your right brain, letting them communicate freely without your ego getting involved, which can be really big thing for people. But the science on it is that you have this area of your brain and there's this uh, lateral habenula in there that's recording all the stress you've ever had in your whole life. When it becomes too much, your brain goes into burst mode and it shuts off all your dopamine production. That's your happiness, your motivation, and you're just caught in this loop. And the ketamine, when you do it medically the first time, takes your brain out of burst mode and you immediately start getting your dopamine back, but it's actually building neural pathways in your brain. And Lamar, you know, from his strokes and things, he told me, you know, I definitely have some cognitive damage that I'm, you know, I'm experiencing. And as we continued to do these treatments with the doctor, he said, I feel like I'm building my brain back up. I feel like I'm like going to the gym, but for my brain. And you hear all about this fentanyl now all coming in from Mexico oh, right. and China and everyone is ODing on fentanyl. Is that yes. going to be and Lamar, you can chime in what you know about mm -hmm. fentanyl and if you ever dabbled as well. No, hell, fentanyl? Hell no. I never I never messed with that and stuff. I think, um, I and think. right now, you, 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 I don't know how people could even um, even want, want to you know, sniff something up their nose knowing that that, um, that deadly dose of fentanyl is in the streets. Yeah, I don't think people do it intentionally, but they don't know they're doing it. And that's where all these crazy ODs are, are happening. So how does, yeah. how would that work with fentanyl? Uh, it, it's actually really powerful. You know, Lamar did two things. He first started out doing these ketamine treatments at the doctor's office because he'd never done any psychedelics before. You know, he'd always been looking for, um, you know, solutions in the exterior world. And he never got, went inside to try to find some answers. So the ketamine kind of took him inside for the first time and he got comfortable with that. And then him and I went down to Mexico where a doctor down there gave him ibogaine, which is an African root, which is actually known to break even a heroin addiction or a meth addiction, opiate addiction, alcohol in one 12 hour session. It's really, really intense, but you know, we, I, we had to do that because I kind of, you know, saw Lamar as being stabilized, but I was like, Hey, you have this addiction profile in your, you know, your persona and you're an African American guy. There's this African American, African root that could maybe break a, an addiction. Maybe you're supposed to be having it. Why don't we just go try it? It's going to be really intense, but maybe just get this monkey off your back and just, you know, live the rest of your life enjoying it as opposed to, you know, a lot of people that say they're sober, they're, you know, drinking coffee with all sugar and vaping and eating, you know, taking Xanax or whatever. And my, that's not a real way to live sober. So I thought, I said, if you can just get back to that, you know, root of who Lamar Odom is, that frequency vibration of when you were a young kid, get back to there, you're going to be able to evaluate when people come to you with this or that, you know, people come to Lamar all the time and say, Oh, you got to try this. It's the best oh. and all that. So I just wanted him to be really steady in who he was so that when people come at him, he could just evaluate it based on how it feels for him. Not, you know, the moment itself. Yeah. Let's take a quick ketamine detour here to talk some boxing with Lamar Odom, because um, I noticed, and I forgot you beat Aaron Carter in the second round just a couple months ago. Uh, another fight against JLo's ex-husband. Uh, that uh, that that took place on Saturday, just Saturday. Yeah. Um, Saturday. So here's an interesting thing. I used to teach boxing, and yeah, yeah, that's how I met Jimmy Kimmel. It's a long okay. story, but that was my job, and. So as a guy I used to teach, you can just watch someone shadow box for five seconds and you know immediately whether they know how to box or not. And I think yeah. there was a story on you. Maybe I saw it on Entertainment Tonight or TMZ or something when you were training. Now, it's always tough to train really tall, long guys because the form just gets funky normally. Yeah. And it's like, it's why yeah. there's no tall, there's no tall gymnasts. 
It's just you can't do what you can't do, and it's why the flyweights always look better than the six the guys that are six seven, right? Their form yeah. is always that much tighter. But I was watching, and they said, "Well, Lamar Odom, he's training," and they show a little B roll of you hitting the focus pads, and I was like, "Okay, this is going to be a shit show because he's seven foot tall and he's going to be all over the place." And I watched yeah. you do five seconds of shadow boxing or five seconds on the punch mitts. And I was like, oh, this guy knows how to box. He has form. Yeah. And I don't yeah. now that's got to suck because when you're shorter, you rely on the tall guy not having any form. But if the tall guy has yeah. form, he's probably going to get to you and knock you out. But did you do some boxing before this or is it because yeah. you're an athlete and know how to train? No, actually, with my best days um, with the with the Lakers, um, I used boxing um, to become a better athlete. But I, I've always I've always been intrigued um, with the sport in in, in the world, and uh, I think I kind of manifested it through, through watching so many boxing matches. And I, you know, I am an athlete, so when I when I see something athletically, I can I, I can um, I can interpret it. I can do it over. Yeah. You got uh, some friends over, Lamar? Yeah, party going on. Get it back. Get it back. You yeah. might tell them we're recording, but yeah. No, nah, I know. I know. I just told them. Um, we're, we're in Miami. Oh, you're in Miami. Nice. Did, yeah, uh, I'm in Miami. All right. We well, got to have fun. The, so you trained because I could tell you had form. You know, you can't mm. just pick it up at age 39 and a half or 40 or yeah. whatever. <laughs> Whatever you were, you can tell you've been doing it. So now the question is, is, is there going to be more of this? And as a, you know, we got a Deontay Wilder is uh, fighting Tyson Fury, couple of heavyweights yeah. that are six foot nine, six foot eight, mm -hmm. you know, uh, yeah. any thoughts of that? And how tall are you? Lamar? I mean, sorry, I'm six foot 10. I'm six foot 10. Um, I don't know. I think I, I think I'll keep it at the celebrity boxing for right now. Um, yeah, I, I don't think I want to move up to those those big guys or anything like that. <laughs> yeah, now I'm only and, asking. And Lamar, Lamar's you're an got athlete. Lamar's got a Lamar's got a really long reach too. I think if you like look at what his wingspan is, it's bigger than a regular six ten guy. So it's like. To me, I knew he was going to win at both of these matches because I was just like, wow, yeah. this guy's an actual amazing athlete, you know, and how are you going to touch him in the face? I mean, unless somebody cracked a rib or something, I couldn't imagine <laughs> that, that yeah. you, you were getting hurt, Lamar. Well, you come up. So let's talk about uh, your career. You, you come up in uh, Jamaica, Queens. Um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> you're uh, you go in the second round. Um, oh, I'm sorry. First, uh, fourth of the first round. I'm trying to I'm trying to find my first answer. round. First, first round, fourth pick. First round, fourth pick. 1999. Where do you go originally? Was it was the LA, LA Clippers? Oh, it's to the Clippers first, and then yeah. and then the Lakers. All right. Yeah. And <clears throat> so you have all. I don't know. Is this a recipe for disaster coming to LA? I mean, after growing up, how you grew up. Um, no, no, it was, it was actually, I guess, meant to be, um, at, at that time, I, I didn't really, I didn't have any, um, bad habits as far as, uh, drugs or anything was concerned. Maybe, maybe only thing besides some marijuana. Um, but, but I, I think it was a dream come true for me to, um, play in LA and especially play for the Lakers. Magic Johnson was the, the, the player that I wanted to be growing up who I, who I tried to custom my game. Um, after, and um, you know, it was meant to be. I think. And being involved with being married to Khloe Kardashian, and living in yeah, LA. I, 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 how else was it, how else was I gonna meet my wife if I didn't if I didn't live in LA? <laughs> you know. Yeah, I'm just saying. It it seems like. I mean, it was it was it was it was it's a it's a lot it's a lot, but you know, I guess that's what you know. We all go through different routes in, 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 in life. I am who I am. I'm standing here, standing tall in my space, my name, claiming my name. I don't, I don't, I don't regret anything. 
Did it ever feel overwhelming to just be in that much of the spotlight all the time, professionally, personally? No. 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 I, I guess, you know, us things having things to do is what keeps us going. I wish I was I wish I was a little bit better at keeping my pack in my pants. <laughs> but um you know, hey, but uh other than that, it, it was a great time. Well, speaking of peckers and pants, that'll segue us into the uh, Love Ranch. Uh, that's where everyone heard the, the story and ODing and, I guess, flatlining and comas. And how did, what was the, obviously that wasn't the plan. <laughs> what was the, what oh, was no. the original plan? Uh, the plan is what? So I love ranch. Design. Yeah, I mean, were, were you going to stay for an evening? Were you going to hang out for a week? Like what? what well, the, you... No, no, no. The, I mean, I was just, I was just going through a divorce, so I was in a really, um, um, you know, messed up headspace. And uh, you know, I, I go to this, this ranch, and to be honest, honest to God, I, you know, I didn't do any drugs that night. Um, and you know, I try to be transparent as possible when I talk about. Uh, my drug use, because you know, maybe me sharing my story can help some people. But I didn't do any drugs that night, so actually, when I'm you know in a, in the hospital, I'm very confused and angry and upset because I didn't know how I got there. <clears throat> and I think I think that's the one of the reasons why you know God spared my life is because no way He wanted me going out with that name, you know, that I died from a drug overdose. And I didn't even do drugs that night. So what? So what were you doing? That were you drinking that night? No, yeah, I had a couple of drinks. You know, um, that was about it. I think somebody slipped something in his drink. I mean, that's the best thing I can imagine is that somebody either for whatever I'll be honest reason. With you too, is, is I mean, you know, the, the the drug addict me and me says, you know, I want to know what it had, what it was, because it had to be some good shit. <laughs> to lay me out for, to lay me out for three days and so, almost take my life. So what is your recollection? Do you have any memory of that that night? You no, know, just going down there and that's about it. And is it um I don't know, if somebody puts something into your drink, it seems like there should be some criminal charges. Is is anyone pursuing yeah, that? I, yeah, I think the dude, uh Dennis Hoff, you know, I don't know. Time goes by. Who the fuck knows? Who knows? Well, Dennis could have been though. Dennis Hoff died. But what? he died. He won. Yeah, he won. And he wound up dying in the same route I, I OD'd it. Oh, really? So wow. I don't, yeah, so I don't know if that's karma or, you know, it's kind of crazy, though. You think about it. That's, that's, that's a movie script in itself. So, uh, and and then you just wake up in the hospital after three days? Yeah. Yeah, really confused. And, you know, scared a little bit. I couldn't, I couldn't walk or talk when I woke up. And All, some, of my, some of my doctors said I could probably, I never walk or talk again because they thought it was so much damage from the strokes. Um, so I'm like a walking miracle. Whenever I go back to the, um, see the sign, I'm like, you know, Prodigal son's return. Did they but, um, did they do a toxicology report? Did they draw blood? Did they try to figure out what was in your system? It, they must have, right? I think so. I think they did. I think they did. And they never said, here's what was coursing through your veins? I think it was some cocaine or some other stuff. Oh. Who knows? Okay. But... You're saying that was put into your drink or into your whatever. I, I, don't, whatever know. It I is. don't know how. I don't. I'm not saying how I got into that. You, you can make your own assumptions, but I'm just saying I just didn't do drugs that night. Okay. Um. All right. For what was I'm trying to think? What? How long? When was that? Now you got two championships with the Lakers, oh nine and and ten, yeah. six man yeah. of the year. Uh. What and that was 2015. What was the plan in 2015? Was there was there professional playing in your future at that point? Um, I don't know how to remember. Um, yeah, I was pretty. I was in still good shape, and um, 
it's crazy because I was talking to some of my friends right now. I'm like, you know, if it wasn't for that action, I probably could still be playing. I, I never had any um, injuries to my lower extremities. My legs still work pretty good. Um, as long as I was able to keep myself in shape, I probably could still be playing right now. Uh, so. Any contact with the Kardashians these days? Are you guys on good terms? No, yeah, we're, we're on good terms, but I don't, I don't speak to them. Uh, Zappy. Yeah. Um, so for you, what's kind of the message you want to put forth with this doc? And, you know, if you're in charge of things, what protocols? I mean, it just seems like we're talking about everyone's ODing on fentanyl. We got a problem. COVID, COVID yeah. didn't help. Got a lot more people yeah. addicted to a lot more stuff. What uh, What do you think the plan should be? Well, you can save. I hope, hopefully, this documentary can save some people and to let them know that they can they can get out of that uh, that dark tunnel that they may be in. Especially with COVID, I know a lot of people are depressed. Probably doing opioids, all types of other shit. So hopefully, yeah. it can help I, some people. Just let, let them know that they're gonna overcome. Yeah, I, I think that is the message, Adam. It's like, you know, we have very real solutions and we don't have to, you know, we can't go back to talk therapy and, you know, the things that, and uh, SSRIs, the kind of things that got us into this problem. So, you know, if it was up to me, I would say everybody, you know, should figure out what the thing they need is, what their trauma is, what their intent is, and Based on that, there's a lot of different plant medicines and opportunities to, uh, you know, to heal. And I think that right now, when you're coming out of a pandemic like this, um, you know, the only thing to do is to try something that's never worked before. And that's where Lamar was at. He was like, you know, he tried everything else. And that's why he agreed to do these very intense psychedelics, because he was like, well, I already tried the therapy. I did this. Not, nothing's working. And so I think. The recipe that I would say is, you know, each one of these plants has a different thing it does. You know, ibogaine for addiction, psilocybin for anxiety, um, ayahuasca if somebody's out of touch with nature. So they each have their their positive attributes. And I'm just I want everybody to realize that we're in a serious situation right now. And if we have access to these amazing natural tools and things that are growing out of the ground, we should take advantage of them rather than just you know, sticking our heads in the sand and saying, well, all we have is, you know, what we've had. And uh, Lamar is living proof that, you know, it's now two and a half years ago since he did Ibogaine. And, you know, I just see him getting better and better. He's been doing his at-home ketamine treatments. We do those now because of COVID. We started doing ketamine treatments with people with lozenges that melt in your mouth. And Lamar is going through a protocol with a company called KetMD, just doing, uh, you know, once a month, lay down in his bed, guided by a nurse, he pops it in his mouth, he has a one hour experience, but each time he does it, he builds those neural pathways. And, you know, as I said, he said to me a bunch of times that he thinks he's building back up those neural pathways that he disrupted during those strokes and heart attacks and drug use. I so, want to, I want to talk about what that lozenge in that one hour experience would be like i want to uh i think what we're going to do is get on the phone with lamar because our internet connection is bad so i think it would be better it's off it's really just... powerful present moment <laughs> awareness space yeah and zappy hold on now your internet connection okay. just got weird all right. Oh, shoot. I'll tell you what. We got to take a we'll take a break. Let me hit a sponsor here and we'll see if we can get reconnected over the phone and see if we can't straighten out some of these internet pops. Uh, first I'll tell you about Podium business owners. You know there aren't enough hours in the day to waste playing phone tag. Uh, the list of customers you need to reach doesn't get any shorter, especially when business is good. That's why local businesses everywhere turn to Podium. Podium makes every interaction as easy as sending a text. So everything that uh, makes you, makes your business money can work great together and get done faster. Plus gathering reviews, collecting payments, and even marketing is easy. And it's made as easy as just pressing send. You won't 
just free up more time, you'll grow your business, close deals with customers before the competition even has a chance to call them back. It's Podium, right, Dawson? Join more than 100,000 businesses that already use Podium to streamline their customer interactions. Get started for free at Podium.com slash Adam or sign up for a paid Podium account and get a free credit card reader. Restrictions apply. That's Podium.com slash Adam. All right, we'll take a quick break. We'll sort this out technically, and we'll be right back after this. Lamar is going to get on a landline, and we'll try to get, if there is, in fact, such a thing as a landline anymore, and we'll see if we can get a little better connection going. So, Zappi, what, what, so walk us through what, what a ketamine uh, lozenge home therapy session might be like, or what's the sensation of it for the patient? Yeah, it, it's an incredible experience, Adam. It's basically you go into this present moment awareness state, where you're sitting there in about five minutes into taking the lozenge, you feel this and you go into this state where there's no future and there's no past. So you're not worried about what's going to happen. You're not regretting anything. You're just right there in the present moment. And you can really look at your life from like a third party perspective and you can do a lot of healing. You can look at some of the things that happened to you that maybe were traumatic from a different perspective and when you come out of it 45 minutes later, it's almost like those things don't have the same charge on them. You know, if you wanted to think about something that happened in business or something that happened in a relationship, what usually would like trigger you with some kind of electrical charge just doesn't really seem to have the charge. And they say that's because when the ketamine metabolizes into this hydroxy norketamine, it builds these new neural pathways around trauma around depression. And a lot of people have like generational trauma where their grandfather, great, great, great grandfather in their DNA, all those memories, all that trauma is basically stored in there. And you're pulling up on that. You may even not know it, or you might have some hereditary trauma loop that you keep going through, or maybe you you know, had a drug issue and you're going through these cycles, like I'm not worthy. Nobody's going to love me. I'm a failure. And everything that you come in contact with, you run through that filter. And this ketamine just builds these new pathways. So you're just like, okay, I'm here in the present moment and now I'm going forward. And I think that's where Lamar's at. That's what's so exciting to watch him, you know, make good decisions, you know, do his life in a little bit of a different way and not even have regrets. Cause you know, he's like just this kind of guy who's already moving forward. He's not thinking about the toxicology report. I'd have a bunch of lawyers on the phone right now, you know, if I saw that thing. And he's just moving forward, moving forward. So I think anybody who does this, anybody who, who has anxiety, depression, suicidal ideation, uh, needs to probably consider the ketamine because a lot of people think that this is uh, synthetics or something, but it's really just some minerals and some salts that they put together and they process it in this new ketamine crystal forms. And it's very, very uniform. And you take that and you get this kind of frequency of that ketamine and it kind of brings you back to your original vibration uh, that you forgot about. How would you compare it? I've never done ketamine, but I've, I've done sensory deprivation like float tanks, you know, and sort of what you were describing, not really a future or past, can be created or recreated in, in one of those sensory deprivation tanks. You seem like a guy who may have floated at some point yes. in your life. Is there, for those of us who haven't done it, is that something that could be analogous to it? It's a really good analogous. It is. Uh, it feels like that, you know, where you're not, necessarily you know in those tanks they set it so your body temperature is the same as the water it's dark you're in there and you just lose sense of your your humanness you know and you're just you're kind of become your consciousness and so i love that you know for me i believe that's part of why people are so out of whack right now is that just they're running through this human filter all the time that's scanning for danger and everything like that and when you can put yourself back, whether that's through a tank or some meditation, breathing, or something like ketamine, when you get yourself to that point where you're no longer human, wow, it's so freeing and it can do a lot. I, I you know, the guy who invented the 
float tank is named uh, John Lilly. And he's actually the original guy who did a lot of the work with ketamine. He said, if you want to meet God, do ketamine and get in a float tank. Right. So that's the Reese's peanut butter cup of higher spirituality (laughs) is. um, And how's ketamine regulated? Where does one get it? What's it considered by the government? When when are they going to get more involved? How does that work? The good news is ketamine is already FDA approved as an anesthetic. It's the number one anesthetic used by oral surgeons on children because it's very safe and it doesn't affect your breathing. So they give it to young kids and they realized at Yale University that actually they realized in the battlefield that that the patients who were getting ketamine and then getting amputations were committing suicide much less than the people who were getting some other anesthetic. They studied it at Yale and they deduced that if you give somebody a low dose, it will can break depression, anxiety. So it's right now it's schedule three, which is nice because that means it does have medical benefit. But they're afraid that maybe it has addictive qualities where things like, you know, LSD and psilocybin mushrooms and other things that could be very positive. Those are schedule one. Those are in the same class as heroin or cocaine uh, right now. Well, that's ketamine. It's great because we already have access to it as a country. Let's circle back to the battlefield amputation. And I know Dr. Drew was featured in the documentary as well. Um, cause I've talked to him about being needing therapy 24 hours after, or almost immediately after trauma for post-traumatic stress syndrome. So if there's a school shooting and your kid's in that school, your kid needs to talk to a therapist like immediately. So don't, don't schedule an appointment for next week. Um, something, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I've talked to Dr. Drew about this and we did love line for a long time. So we talked to a lot of people that were traumatized, you know, once it, takes hold once it gets into your system once it gets into the your gets into you on a cellular muscle fiber le- level it's hard to get out so it's the yeah. ketamine thing so obviously not not much more traumatizing than a battlefield amputation right but yeah. the ketamine you're saying with the ketamine it doesn't set like it would set with somebody who didn't have the ketamine, which is sort of like saying the kid that got to the therapist hours after the school shooting versus the one that never got to the therapist. Is that analogous yeah, again? I'm, I think, I think it is. I think, you know, if you unfortunately go through some kind of a trauma, you create this pattern in your brain that could be fear and anxiety, and you just keep replaying that thing and waiting for it to happen or something else horrible to happen. And those patterns get dug in really deep. And so what's beautiful about the ketamine is even if it was years later, when you go in there and you can look at that trauma from a third party perspective and you look at it, a lot of times I've given it to people who are addicted and things and they come out and they go, you know what? I just realized that what happened to me, that happened to me, but it's not me. I'm me. And it's so freeing just seeing that, you know, differentiating between you and the trauma that happened to you, that that alone can free you. And um, I think, you know, Dr. Drew, he's amazing. He was in my first movie, The Reality of Truth. And he said he thought that psychedelics, the first indication use was going to be end of life because they had done already some interesting study with psilocybin mushrooms where people were in the study were had, you know, three months to live or three weeks to live, and they had to come off of their antidepressants to be in the study. Once they did the psilocybin mushroom therapy, none of them went back on their antidepressants. All of them were like, yeah, you know what, I'm going to die, but I'm okay with it. And a lot of them mended their family situations at the end. And so I think we just have to embrace this and say, just as wrong as society probably was about, you know, whether cannabis has medicinal benefits We have to see that, you know, these psychedelic compounds have medical benefit that we as a society can use right now, especially 
you know, coming out of a pandemic and having a total addiction epidemic, you know, ravaging the country. Is this a fair statement? Um, there's a lot of stuff that benefits us, such as, you know, vigorous daily exercise, right? And everyone's aware of it. Eat kale and work out all the time and you won't be fat. But the rub is no one wants to do the work, you know? And so we're always kind of looking for some sort of fudge brownie that doesn't have calories or some workout apparatus that I can operate while I'm sitting down and watching TV. Like we're, <laughs> we're, we're trying to get around sort of what is. Yeah. And it seems like what you're talking about, you know, if we all went to a yurt and meditated every day for an hour and took cold plunges and, you know, went with um, Wim Hof style and, and all that, if we did all of that, maybe we could arrive at the same place as some of the stuff you're talking about ingesting. But reality is, is nobody's doing that. And, right. and so are you sort of saying this is a synthetic way to get there? And what, I, what, I, and furthermore, you know, you see, you see these weight watchers things and they're talking about eat macaroni and cheese and eat, but we all know when you talk to a real nutritionist, they go, no, it's not going to work. It, it seems like a shortcut. It won't. There's diet and exercise. That's what works. But is this, is there a road to get there that involves a whole bunch of work and no ketamine <laughs> that no one yeah. will do? And then how much does ketamine synthesize that or how much, how much, how much closer does it get you to the goal line of being spiritually where you want to be? Yeah, I, I think, you know, right now in society, that's a good way to look at it. We, we're being bombarded with technology and information that's coming at us at a level that I don't even think our brains are meant to handle. And so we need some kind of a biohack. And I see these psychedelics as like a biohack, you know, rather than you know, personally, if I had a drug uh, problem, I wouldn't want to go through all that detox and go into meetings two times a day and trying to think about not using. I'd rather use something like Ibogaine, get it over in 24 hours, not have to go through all that detox. And, you know, that sounds a little bit like a magic bullet, but there is a lot of work you have to do afterwards to integrate it. Like, you know, like we're saying here, which is, you know, once you do it, you want to work with people who can help you to integrate that experience into your life. So it's not just a one-time thing where you're good for a few months and then, you know, you're right back to square one. But I think, you know, the ketamine, what's exciting about it is that, you know, even Timothy Leary back in the sixties and seventies, he was working with ketamine. He said, he believes it unlocks the highest level of your brain. And if you see somebody's brain on the ketamine, uh, medical ketamine, you can see that 80% of their brain is lit up. It's like the limitless drug that we're all going, oh, we need the limitless drug. And I'm like, this is ketamine. And it's actually, the benefit is when you do an antidepressant like an SSRI, it's you're doing it every day. It's in your body changing your brain chemistry. With the ketamine, you do it you know, once a month, something like that. You grow these neural pathways and then you don't have it in your body. You're just getting the benefit without having to, you know, constantly be altering your energy and your frequency. I would say this ketamine might be looked back on in the future as, you know, a real breakthrough where society couldn't handle the technology and this hack of the ketamine, medical ketamine, kind of evolved our brains quicker than it otherwise would have evolved and helped us to catch up because. A lot of people that do ketamine, they almost just, I'm sorry, a lot of people that do the ibogaine, which is this African route that Lamar did, they say it feels like you've got, you know, 10 million little robots in there with scissors, just cutting out all the garbage and noise and social media and stuff that's in there. And you come out and it's like, oh my God, I have like, I defrag my brain. I have like a third more capacity now to move forward. That's, that's exciting right now when you're battle, kids are battling and parents battling social media and influence. It's like, what's going to disrupt that? It's not going to be that Facebook turns over a new leaf and all of a sudden they become super conscious. It's like, we have to, as a society, get a critical mass of people that go inside themselves, come out with more empathy 
And then together as a group, I think we could solve a lot of the problems that we have because, you know, we would be thinking about them kind of like Einstein said, you can't solve a problem with the same consciousness or thinking that got you into it. You need a different solution. And this looks like the most, you know, impressive and safe way to shortcut all that work that nobody's ever going to do. Lamar, by the way, we cannot reach on the phone, so I hope he's okay. But uh, maybe it's the connection, but that's all right. We got Zappy, the brains of the organization <laughs> here. Um, what can we do? All right, so a couple things. Uh, what if someone is listening and they just go, I want to check this out. Um, I'm, I'm not addicted, or maybe I am. But I'd like to try this and see where it went. And maybe I'll like it, maybe I won't like it. What would be the starter kit for the uninitiated who just went, I want to give this a whirl? Yeah, this is, I think, where it's good to work with somebody like myself, where they're, you know, a psychedelic concierge. And by that, I mean just that, like a concierge at a hotel, you go to them and you say, hey, where should I eat dinner tonight? And they say, what kind of food do you like? Do you like wine? Do you want to be indoor, outdoor? And they come up with a solution based on that, the best case. Mm -hmm. And for me, I listen to people's trauma. You saw in the movie, Lamar's mom died when he was, you know, 12 years old. His, you know, son died at six months old. That's a lot of trauma to just be carrying around and trying to bury. Mm -hmm. And so- you know, I look at that and I say, when I analyze that and I analyze this drug problem as well, I said, okay, Lamar, let's start with ketamine because you'll go to a doctor's office. You're going to feel safe. Your your handlers and everybody are going to feel okay to allow you to do that. And then once he got more comfortable with me, I said, look, this African root could break an addiction. You have that profile. You should do it. So I think, you know, somebody else, if they said, hey, I have anxiety, I just, I can't get over it. I would probably say to them, hey, come do, you know, do an at-home ketamine treatment. Try that in the context of your own bedroom being guided over telemed. And then I would probably say maybe you should be microdosing psilocybin mushrooms, which every time I've microdosed psilocybin mushrooms, which is a subperceptual dose. Uh, I always feel incredible and I go, oh, wow, this is probably what people who are taking antidepressants What is subperceptual? I mean, you don't uh, hallucinate. Is that what that means? Correct. It, it means that you don't actively know that it's happening. It's kind of like homeopathic medicine where you put a little bit of the medicine in right. and it triggers your body to have a response. That's usually a microdose is usually about a tenth of a regular hit. So if, for example, you were going to take one gram of mushrooms to get a full reaction, you would take a tenth of a gram, just a little, little bit, and you would go about your day. You could play with your kids. You could go to work. But you just have this like underlying tone of energy and maybe a little bit more joy. And um, I've noticed in the days in between the microdosing, that I'm actually making a lot of really good decisions. How many is what happens for me? Are there a lot of people that are quietly participating in this? Are there a lot yes. of celebrities and people we may have heard of who are quietly, now I don't mean secretly, but just like quietly involved with this? We'd yeah, be surprised. It's really, you'd be very surprised. Some of them are, you know, Will Smith came out the other day in uh, GQ magazine, I think it was, and he said that. He went and did ayahuasca, which is a, a root that grows in the rainforest. Uh, he did that about eight times, I believe. And he said it was the first time in his life that he felt like this human joy and he'd never experienced it before. So you have Will Smith, you have Megan Fox talking about her experience. You have uh, the comedian Dak Shepard coming out and saying that during Corona, he used psilocybin you know, to work on himself. And I've got a lot of people, you know, uh, everybody from, you know, celebrities to politicians to, you know, thought leaders who are kind of sitting here during coronavirus. And I've been encouraging them, hey, this is a great time to, you know, work on your mental health and you've got the alone time, you know, go inside yourself. This is a silver lining on the, uh, I think the silver lining on the coronavirus thing is that people realize they need to work on their mental health and they got comfortable with uh, telemedicine. And so that's allowing really 
this kind of psychedelic therapy and, and integration work to happen without somebody feeling like they're getting less than they should get. So could one just go online and look up psychedelic concierge and move forward from there? Yeah, that, that's a possibility. I think also, you know, ketamine is a great place to start because a lot of times the people that I try to send who need plant medicine, I tell them, you got to go sit with a shaman. And they say, hey, Zappy, if I tell my family I'm going to the jungle, sit with a shaman, they're going to baker act me immediately. There's no way I can do it. But if you tell somebody, hey, I'm going to, you know, a company like KetMD that I'm involved with, you say, you know, to somebody, hey, you're going to, in the privacy of your home, guided by a nurse, overseen by a doctor, you're going to have these very gentle experiences and you're going to have a life changing, you know, because again, ketamine, the number one side effect is it breaks suicidal ideation, which is almost, you know, very difficult to do. One session, what happens, Adam, is usually when people are going to kill themselves, they either think, okay, I keep doing what I'm doing or I kill myself. Those are my only two choices. And they take the ketamine lozenge, they lay back and about, you know, 15 minutes into that experience, they're in that present moment state, like you got in with the tank. And all of a sudden, these 10 more option sets open up. And they're just like, oh, you know what, I like doing that, which could lead to this, which could lead to that. They come out. And I've had people with bandages on their wrist where they actively tried to kill themselves. And they come out of that 45 minutes. And they're just like, wow, I'm not going to kill myself. This is so interesting. And I don't know, I just got to see this through a little bit more. And so if they, the Yale University came up with a protocol that we use at KetMD, which is if you have treatment resistant depression, you do six treatments in two weeks to build up enough neural pathways to offset whatever damage is there. And then you do it, you know, on a semi-regular once a month, once a quarter, depending on if you feel yourself kind of slipping back, you do one treatment and, you know, continue to build. It's like, reinforcing a foundation that's been disrupted. Uh, very interesting stuff. I'm sorry, Lamar got uh, lost in the shuffle, but I'll give it a plug. Lamar Odom Reborn. And if you need any release information, you can go to lamarodomreborn.com. And Zappy, where do we find you? If somebody wants to reach out. Uh, I'm best found at zappyzappolin.com, Z-A-P-P-Y-Z-A-P-O-L-I-N.com. You can find me there. You can find me on social media. And uh, I'm really here to just encourage people because we, you know, in 1971, they made this stuff illegal because they claimed that it needed to be studied for safety, which I think probably made sense back then. But here we are 50 years later. We, millions of people have taken these things many with a lot of great benefit. And we, I think we have to demand the right to access this stuff now and say, okay, we're not going to just sit here and have the government or somebody tell us that, you know, uh, tobacco is good, but cannabis is bad. And, you know, this is good, but psilocybin is not good. It's like, no, we know basic medical and science. And if there are things that can save our family members from suicide or addiction, we have to be able to access these We can't just wait around anymore. Thank you for joining us, Zappy. I hope to talk to you again uh, very soon. Thank you. Glad you enjoyed the movie. Very enjoyable. I recommend it highly. All right. Last but not least, there's LifeLock fraudsters posing as IRS agents, police officers, or power companies are tricking victims into sending online gift cards or reading gift card numbers. Over the phone is payment. It's important to understand how cybercrime and identity theft are affecting our lives. Every day, we put our info at risk on the internet in an instant. Cyber criminals could harm your finances, credit, and your reputation. Good thing there's a LifeLock. LifeLock helps detect a wide range of identity threats, like your social security number, for sale on the dark web. If they detect your information has potentially been compromised, they'll send you an alert. Protect yourself with LifeLock. Right, Dawson? No one can prevent all identity theft or monitor all transactions at all businesses, but you can keep what's yours with LifeLock by Norton. Join now and save up to 25% off your first year by using promo code ADAM. Call 1-800-LIFELOCK or head to LifeLock.com and use promo code ADAM for 25% off. 
This yeah, looks like a restaurant. Who paid? Now, here's here's what we did. Okay. We had about a three-year run. Oh, oh that's the magic. Fro. That's glorious. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Every face in that picture tells a story, a different story. <laughs> oh, my mom is such a delight. <laughs>